Hello, everyone. My guest today is Amit Kothari. He's uh, spent a decade in London at the cutting edge of collaboration technologies for the enterprise. His clients were the world's largest companies, law firms, and government entities. After seeing the platforms with, with emerging chat tools, he realized that the disruption of the industry depended on combining unstructured chat with structured processes. Processes that help every business scale their operations and chatting on Slack or project management is not the same as process management. The result of this was his company, Talify, which has raised $1.3 million to date from top investors in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, including 500 startups and Alchemist Accelerator. Amit, are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, All right. to be on the show. So, so tell me um, tell me more. We Obviously, we've had you on before. I remember one of the things we discussed last time you were on is you, you were a lot more agency than you were software at the time. You were doing way more kind of professional services revenue than you were subscription revenue. Tell us what the company does and do you still see that revenue mix? We effectively relaunched the company. So you have a pivot and then you have just like the whole product just got rebuilt. So what we did for the past eight months is rebuild the product from scratch um, and really took like a design first, UX first, um, API first, mobile first approach to everything. And the result, we launched it in January, 1st of Jan. So it's only been like a month of the product being live. And by the way, um, if your listeners want to know right now, we're on AppSumo. So if you want to grab like bag an amazing deal, 39 bucks for three users for life, AppSumo.com slash So I mean, why on earth, I just have to ask you a question. I think it's the stupidest thing for CEOs of SaaS companies to put deals on AppSumo because Noah's a genius and he knows if he can convince a SaaS CEO to sell a lifetime subscription, by nature, it's going to get a lot of signups. By the way, it also kills your lifetime value. Why on earth would you put your deal on AppSumo? Well, for starters, it's it's a constrained deal. So it's only three users. So it's Yeah, really but it's only, life. It's you know, for life. It is. But we launched, you know, in the first week of January. And to be honest, what we've learned in about a week, it's probably about six months of learning if you had a normal pace of growth. Because you have like, literally, I'm not kidding you, we had one person signing up every 30 seconds at one point last week, right? Telling us stuff that, you know that face part moment you get when you just like smack your own face and think, oh my God, that's just so obvious, right? We had like 50 of those moments last week. So in terms of improving the product. I get the velocity. I mean, I get the velocity argument, but I mean, how does it feel when you think about this in a quiet time of your day and you go, I just basically have told these people, if they give me their money today, I will support this product, do all the bug fixes for life, for for life. Yeah, there is the cost issue for sure. But then what we do is, you know, we, we- It's also a promise that's hard to make for life. We weigh up what we get in return. And in these early days, what we get is by far greater than the money because we save like seven. Yeah, but what bucks. about the customer? Yeah. What about the customer was it who paid X amount of money for life? I mean, four, five, six, ten years from now, if you either shut the company down, raise more and exit to a bigger company and they shut you down or you don't do bug fix or, or for any reason over the life. So forever, forever is a long word. If anything happens, that basically comes back on you. How does that make that customer base feel that came in through AppSumo? Well, you know, we see them like free users. We have a freemium app right? They just happen to be free with VIP benefits. Well, they've paid, so they don't see it as free. Well, in terms of features, it's three users. It's not enterprise plan, so it's not like we have phone call support or anything like that. It's just like every other user, except you have more features. So the cost base isn't that great for us, you know, because you had to support them anyway, whether they were free or paid. It, it, yeah, so, just to be clear, though, it's what they're expecting. They pulled out their check, they pulled out their credit card and wrote, and, you know, and gave you amount of money, and they're expecting for life. That that I always wonder, you know, when SaaS here's here's what I see that when SaaS companies do a lifetime deal, what it tells me is they haven't figured out growth because that literally kills every every aspect of your SaaS economics. There's no lifetime value, you know, it increases sure. you know support costs. It's over life. No, I get you. So it's great for validation, and that's really it. Um, and really, that's what we crucially needed at that time and at this time right now. But so what we're learning is one thing, but the other thing is add-ons. So our pricing strategy actually has add-ons too. So we have in our pricing plan put together a bunch of add-ons and remember above three users, you don't get anything. So we have kind of left that door open for a bunch of revenue down the road. In fact, many of them have upgraded. So give me those numbers, right? So, so, so how many people have it? What percentage of have you been able to actually upsell into a new plan? You know, we don't even have numbers. Like literally we launched a month ago. So it's very unrepresentative right now. 
Well, you said uh, it's a pretty big uh, cohort, though. You said you were signing up a customer every 30 seconds. You have plenty of customers to look at. Yeah, at least between, it's between two and 3,000 signups just in the last That's two weeks. That's plenty of a cohort to look at to see what percentages have you been able to upsell. Yeah, we're looking more at retention, though. So, again, it's like an experiment to see, like, who logs back in every day? Why do they log back in? You know, what have they done? So the data we're collecting is actually the gold. It's actually the oil. It's not the, the revenue, right? And that means we now tune our onboarding our, our trials, our pricing, our features, everything to what is the value that we're delivering to the customer. So what are you learning? What are they using the most? What's the activation metric? We found something really strange. The first thing you do when you log in is change your logo, like your face and your organization logo. But well, well, hold on. I mean, let's what? back up. People don't know what you do. What do you do? Oh, okay. Let's back up. So I'll tell you a very quick story, okay? I spent like a decade like mapping flowcharts for processes and things like that in companies. And I thought making like process documentation made me really successful. Like, oh, wow, our process is documented, guys. Clap your hands. Well, you know what? No one looks at it. That's the problem we set out to solve. That how do you make it easy to follow a process for people doing it? So we rebuilt the company in that vein. And now people are telling us, hey, look, you know, I actually work in Gmail. I work in Outlook. Can I do my stuff there? So now we're building plugins for Gmail and Outlook. Um, so we built it for that, set, you know, Ugly, boring process software is well overdue. So we want to demo, yeah, bring this to everybody for small businesses. And we target medium-sized companies, ideally. Okay. Um, and that's really the mission. And now, is uh, this, is you, so do you, did you, do you have any organic customers not AppSumo related right now, or they're all AppSumo yeah. related? Yeah. In fact, from our old version, we have an overhang of a bunch of MRR that we are transitioning over to the new platform. Um, again, you know, painfully because yeah. change and habits and stuff. So, I mean, just understand the, 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 the scale of this transition. I mean, generally speaking, you're talking sub a million in ARR that you're trying to transition over or, you know, sub a hundred grand. Generally, where are you? Uh, no, it's nowhere near. So, you know, well, I told you last time, which I think was like five, five, 10 K type of MRR. Yeah. That's what we're trying to, and some of them are starting fresh, which is awesome you know, they start new, so we don't have to transition them. How do but you, it's very painful. Yeah. How do you decide what the right kind of customer is to listen to? What you just told me is you've taken this audience, which, yeah. which is a discount audience. They are the Groupon shopper, by the way, Groupon's out of business. They are the Groupon discount shopper. You are now putting your product roadmap basically as what they request. Is that a smart move? Uh, from what we get back in return, yes, it's a very, very small move. What do you get back um, in return? We can also launch a, well, we get their opinions. Their, we get the same bug report like five times. And we think, oh, yeah, that's a thing now, right? So we get that in terms of how we um, do you know, product roadmap. That's not my question. My question but, is when, when they send you ideas and, say, and that's how you come up with Gmail and Outlook plugins, you're, you are getting user feedback from a very specific cohort of users which don't like spending money. In fact, they are a yeah. discount audience. They are the JCPenney shopper, the Groupon user, both out of business. Is it smart yeah. to listen to a discount audience to drive your roadmap? You know, you, got, you have a great point. I would say 5% probably or less are bad apples in the sense that they're just out for a deal, right? The rest actually care about the value that they're getting from, uh, from us. And How do you know that? All, you know, well, they're actually offered to pay for add-ons that we didn't, literally, they invented an add-on and said, can I pay you for it? Well, so quantify that. How many people have paid for, for something else that's not the AppSumo deal? It's just started happening in the last four days. Um, one, for example, is live chat support in the app, right? The second is advanced features like webhooks and use of the API. The third is help me map by process into your system, which is kind of like a a paid kind of, kind of onboarding call, if you will. Imagine doing a demo, but you get paid for it. Yeah. Well, what is a product request you've said no to from these guys in the past week? Many people think we're time tracking, but there's many time tracking apps like Toggle and a whole bunch of others. So we're going to integrate with them using Zapier. We're not, you know, we do repeatable processes. We help you scale. And by the way, Nathan, you know, you need to scale too, right? So anything you're doing that needs to scale is a process. And by the way, a process is not a project. And to be honest, that language, that psychology is what I wanted to test with these AppSumo people. If I just say to you, hey, this is a process tool, did you think it's a project management tool or not? 
I mean, you're sp- you're you're talking about a definition of a word, right? The perceptions of reality. Well, it's so big because a project isn't a process, right? My a, point a is, project, I don't uh, think that's a buying point for people. I don't think people are going to say, "Oh, I I didn't want a project tool. I want a process." So I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and says that. No, you're right. I mean, it's just a word. But what, when the value of the word is expressed, like you can scale this way, but you can't scale this way. Right. Well, I, I wouldn't believe that because I would say I put projects into Trello and Basecamp and I scale fine. Now, when you get to 15 people or 20 people, so that's the, when I say mid sized company, um, as soon as you get to like that sort of range, 100 people, for example, it then becomes like a serious process issue, right? Yeah, sure. But you don't have pe- people using AppSumo are not 100 person CEO companies. They're not spending time on AppSumo hunting for a $10 discount. Sure, but you'd be surprised at some of the sizes of companies. You know, there's been four enterprise customers that bought an AppSumo deal. And they just said, I don't care about the AppSumo. Just talk to my IT guy. We'll talk enterprise. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. It's not just that kind of audience. Sometimes, yes, I agree with you. You get bad apples, right? Like 5% that are just looking for that. But... It's, yeah, but that's who you're listening to. No. Like you just told me they're asking for like Gmail plugins. Like that, this is this is what I think the danger is early on in a product life yeah, cycle. Great if, question. So how do you listen to the right people? Yes, the right and feedback? the only thing so that the only the thing ways, you can tie that back to me is what you want to build. Like because you can find any piece of feedback you want. You, you'll get yeah. if you're if you secretly are wishing for a product thing, you will find the support ticket that validates that idea, and you will move that through your your sprint for the next two weeks. We try and map it back to two things, engagement and the value we deliver. So if 10 people say the same thing that looks like it's a valuable business move on their part for for, for us to run their systems, right? We think, oh my God, that's actually value. We can do add-on costs. We can charge for that. Yeah. So we validate that. The second thing is Mixpanel is used to measure engagement. Like, do you actually log in or are you just saying, I want this feature? If you build it, I'll use it. So if you say that, we say, no, thanks. You're not even using it, right? So we look back in Bixpanel and say, is this person actually logging in every day? You know, are they actually using this? And are they so, are they are they inviting eight, eight coworkers into it? Right? So based on the seriousness of their business running on our system, we're testing that. Yeah. So, so just to be clear though, right now in terms of company size, you're doing about between five and ten can MOR, which is your old legacy revenue, and you just got a huge chunk of change, which are one time sales. It's thirty percent of what AppSumo oh, collected. I, it's money, but I'm just ignoring it. It's as if it never happened. Yeah. So You're just pretending it didn't yeah. happen. So, yeah. so here's an interesting question for you. Um, I mean, what did you actually stop and then relaunch? Is it just a reskinning or was the product significantly changed? Absolute. Like we reinvented the whole company. The so why not just shut it down? Why, why not shut the, here's what you obviously have a dirty cap table. You have 500 on it. You have a bunch of other investors on it. If you're going to relaunch anyway, why not shut the company down, take a failure, move on and start fresh? Well, the brand equity and the SEO and the rankings we'd already been, you know, were already there. We just had to reskin things. And the basic idea, process management, is when I spoke to you last, it's still the same idea. It's just done much better. Right? So if, if I was, for example, Slack and I launched Slack poorly 10 years ago, I would relaunch the same idea, but just better, right? And that's really what we did. The idea hasn't changed. Um, so we rebuilt the API first, and then we built the UI on top, a whole brand new one. And I think if Apple made a workflow app, it would look like this. Mm-hmm. So, so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what's the plan for this year? I know your, your co-founder, I hope she's still around, was your wife, right? Is that, she, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Good. She's our product. Uh, yeah, she's the yin of the yang. That's good. And how um, many team members are you at today? We're at least, you know, we're 15 plus okay. um, a bunch of part-time contractors. And, and, you're, well. and you're burning cash because of what you've raised and your re- revenue is relatively slow. How do you manage burn relative to how many months of life you have left? Well, yeah, it's a fact of life, right? Everyone has a fixed lifetime, but we, we have enough to last for the foreseeable future. Mm-hmm. Um, What's that mean? Are you talking like six months, 12 months? What's foreseeable future mean? Oh, at least 12 months, Okay, in our opinion, yeah. And we're not in Silicon Valley, so, you know, this is St. Louis. Yeah. So it's, it's just not, it's just a whole different scale here. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's not too bad. So, so how do you think, I mean, how many years do you think it will take you to grow into the valuation which you've raised at? I mean, if you've raised 1.3 million and you're selling 10, 20% of your company, right? You're, you're being valued at 5 million bucks, which means you got to grow ARR, you know, to call it at least a million or 2 million or 160 grand a month. How, how do you get to that scale? Well, I hope to do a series A next year. So accordingly, we need to get to something like 100 or more um, in, in 12 to 18 months from now. So that's the basic mission, really. It's heads down for that. So where do you think that growth is going to come from? It's not an AppSumo deal. 
we have amazing hacks for, for that kind of thing. I mean, obviously everyone does content marketing. That's just the usual thing, right? The thing is, it's not very focused. So I think getting to people and partnering is one way. Um, there's other mechanisms that I wouldn't want to reveal in public, but there's so if I was to talk to you in secret, you'd probably jump on your bed and think, holy shit, this is awesome. Well, I mean, um, to be fair, not yet because you haven't done it. I mean, the, the MR growth isn't there. So I'd wait to see you killing it no, and then right. go, what, yeah. on, what on earth is a meat doing? This guy's a genius. How's he growing this so fast? Well, I think we have to differentiate between a growth hack, which is more a temporary, like, I'll get banned from LinkedIn type thing, or something that's predictable, sustainable, long run. Right? Yeah. It's hard to find things, though, that everyone thinks you find a growth channel where the CAC is one third of the LTV and it's just going to exist forever. The fact of the matter is they they don't. These are all honeypots and you can milk the honeypot for a while, but eventually competitors move and increase the price or you exhaust the whole cohort and you have to go find a new honeypot. The best companies are the ones that actually continually find new honeypots. And that takes a creative mind and an analytical one. We're taking a different approach. Nathan. We're actually thinking about are we 100 times better for this use case? than anything else in the world. So for example, client onboarding. When you win a new client, you have to welcome them and make a great first impression, right? If you don't, it sucks. So can we build a solution that literally is like not a Trello, not a base cap, like literally a billion times better than anything else out yeah, there? Yeah, but who, right? who, who, who is the one telling you and measuring and saying this is a billion times better? Well, for the last three years, even in version one, the best, one of the use cases, the big ones was that. So it's kind of been validated and proven. That no, but it hasn't, big. though. You don't have, you, the base camera trailer are way, 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 way bigger than you. They have way more customers, way more revenue. How can you make any argument that you are a billion times better than them? For a niche, right? So it's, it's, we've got to pick that tiny, we've got to pick a spot at this size. Yeah. And just say, this is our spot. And I think that's just, you know, reasonable strategy at this point. Yeah. And just say, we are the best in the world at this one thing and nothing else. Yeah, now right? you have to go find those customers. Um, and yeah. then you've got to find them. So that hack to find them, it's better if you have an itch. Yep. Right? Well, look, I'm, I'm hitting you hard and I appreciate you being vulnerable because a lot, everyone goes through this stage. When you start a company, you have to go through this oh, stage. Oh, I love it. These are great questions. So, well, I'm actually well, going to write a post on Medium about some of these debacles. Okay, well, uh, we'll, see, we'll, make, we'll, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I mean, it, it, but thank you for being so transparent and vulnerable. I, I appreciate that. I know that's not easy and it can feel sucky sometimes, but I want to celebrate stories like yours because everyone has to go through it at some point. No, and I, I, I don't like being defensive either, so I hope that I've... You're not. It's given great. you the information that, that people want to hear. No, but, it's uh, it's not what they want to hear, but it's what's actually happening in the business, so I appreciate it, right? Yeah. Let's it's hard to separate the emotions of this roller coaster thing from just telling you the story about it. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, it is emotional. Most yeah. people don't care about that. But, well, well, they do. Yeah. What's the most emotional thing that's happened in terms of the company and you and life in general? Well, reinventing the whole product and the the whole thing from scratch about seven months ago was just like, are you stupid? You know, what, what is wrong with you? Uh, was that your wife? Yes. Was that your wife saying that or just words in your head? I think most, I think most folks agreed after some reasoning, but investors, you know, um, of course, a bunch of people, but it seemed reasonable. Yeah. So, you know, I think a better product is going to win. And, and I think at the moment with the better product in this space, and I, I just want to improve that. Um, I make it just so awesome that you just want to lick your screen when you see it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I so, hope I, I hope, you know, the most successful CEOs I've interviewed are not the ones that have monopolized a space and they don't even have the best product. What they have done is they've multi, they have monopolized a single distribution channel. And mm -hmm. maybe that's the number one ranking in an app exchange somewhere. It's the number one ranking when you search on the app store on your phone, if it's a mobile app, but they have monopolized a single distribution channel. So I hope you find that over the next 12 months, we'll have you back on. In the meantime, I mean, let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, what is the last book you read? Uh, the Alchemist by uh, Paulo Coelho. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying there in St. Louis? Um, I guess I'm following MasterCard, but no particular... CEO, I just like the company in general. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the business besides your own? Um, I, we, we love Basecamp because we do product design and stuff on it. Um, so I guess at the moment, that's the, the end thing. And GitHub, oh God, we love GitHub, yeah. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I get enough sleep. I love sleep, so at least nine, I guess eight, okay. nine hours. That's good, yeah. and what's your situation? Obviously married, do you have any kids? We don't have kids, but okay. you know, I get pressure right now. So. <laughs> That's good. And how old are you? Uh, 35. 35. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Uh, demand generation 
trumps product or ideas anytime. So it's true. Even yep. if you had nothing, just freaking start a blog about it and then think about building a product after that. Demand generation trumps product every time there guys have it. He reinvented himself over the past six months. He's now focused on transitioning five to 10 K and MR over to his new product workflow management. He's focusing and trying to understand which cohort he wants to serve over the long run, trying to do a series a early next year, which means he's got to go from where he is today to about a hundred grand and MRR. We'll see if it happens. Amit, thank you for taking us to the top. Thanks, David.